Welcome to the Mount of Olives. As you can see below me in the Kidron Valley, there's still so many olive trees. This whole mountainside used to be covered with thousands, hundreds of trees, and it's such a pleasant place to come. Now here also you can see in the distance, there's a huge graveyard, and that's a Muslim graveyard. There's 300,000 Jewish graves on the Mount of Olives. There's thousands of Christian graves on the Mount of Olives. And you're like, okay, olive trees, graves, what is this? Well, we know that this is also called the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And in the Old Testament, Joel actually speaks about this as the place of the final judgment, where the nations will be judged. So you're going to put your people here so they can be the first ones to be judged. But also, the Jewish people say that the Shekinah, the presence of the Lord in the temple, came from the temple. He left the temple. And where is he? Some theologians say he's right here. So they want to be as close as possible to that. The place of the judgment of all nations. It's very interesting that right here to my left is the church of all nations, where the Lord himself pronounced judgment on the nations. His judgment was mercy. And this is the place where that judgment came when he was in prayer. Here we are very close to where the Lord taught his disciples to pray. We have one of the evangelists, Matthew, saying that this whole discourse happened on the Sermon on the Mount. But Luke says, no, it happened here. In fact, if you look at chapter 11, he talks about that. His disciples saying, Lord, teach us how to pray. It's just after he went to Bethany, which is right over this ridge, and just before he speaks to the Pharisees, which would have been over here in the old city, right next to the temple. So we have come here so that we can also ask the Lord this same question. Teach us, Lord, how to pray, if we only knew this gift of God. Let's go up a little bit further to one of my favorite places here on the Mount of Olives, and let's talk about what he teaches us when he teaches us how to pray. Follow me. On the Mount of Olives, we've made our way into one of these gardens that I just love. It's a secret garden, a beautiful place, a really quiet place usually to come and pray. And you have this incredible view of a good part of the Kidron Valley, and you can imagine it just filled with olive trees in the past. But most especially, it's just a few feet, well, maybe a few minutes walk, from the ruins of the great Eleona Church. It's called the Eleona, not because St. Helen built it, but Eleona in Greek means olives. It was a complex that she built over a cave that the Judeo-Christians showed her, where they said Jesus taught his disciples to pray there. Maybe some of them had been uh, taught by Jesus himself. And so in that place, we'll take you there in a few episodes, there's the cave and then that church was so large it extended all the way out to the area of the Ascension, which is just in front of us. So this is as close as we can get to the place where Jesus answered that question that they gave him, teach us how to pray. I know that each one of us is asking the Lord the same thing during this Lent. Lord, teach me to pray. Give me this great gift, this gift. If I knew this gift, show me this gift. Let me know this gift. And so when Jesus prays, of course, he teaches us with his own example. He doesn't have to do a lot. In a, in a way, right? We can just watch him. We can listen to him. And he actually gives us the theological pathway for prayer. He, in his example, shows us how to pray in faith, 
in hope, and in love. And many of us know that that's the typical or most, I would say, classical way to begin a personal prayer is making an act of faith in the Lord, an act of hope in Him, confidence in Him, and of course, loving Him. But the Lord also explicitly taught us how to pray. He gave us lessons, and that's what we're going to talk about right now. When He does this, He actually builds on, you know, the figures of the Old Testament, the people in the Old Testament that taught, you know, the ancient Israelites how to pray. That's why it's so neat to be able to look out over the Al-Aqsa where the ancient Temple Mount was. You know, people like Abraham that came through this area, Isaac, Jacob, um, Moses, uh, the Old Testament figures there, all the prophets, Elijah, they all taught us about prayer. But the Lord teaches us something new. It's the kingdom, the newness of the kingdom. And that means he opens to us the prayer to the Father, and he teaches us also about the Spirit. So what is the context, content of his teaching? We've broken it down into a few points, and so let's talk about that. Jesus emphasized first and foremost when we pray an attitude that we need to have, which is perfect for Lent, and that is the conversion of heart. Conversion, turning back toward, turning around and being attentive to him, to the Lord. When we enter into a conversation with somebody, we're attentive to them. And if not, you know, we know people like this, they just have monologues, they just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk because they're not attentive to people in front of them. And many times we can ask ourselves, is my prayer just a monologue? Am I saying anything? Is my mind just going off somewhere where all I have to, thinking of all the things I need to do? It happens to all of us. And that's why this conversion really means turning to him in attentiveness. He's 100% focused on us in prayer. And so it's making that effort to be focused on him. So what he actually talks about uh, in prayer, Matthew, one of the apostles actually wrote about it in chapters five and six. He says, when you're converting your heart, that means that you're reconciling with your brothers before presenting an offering at the altar. You're loving your enemies. You're praying for your persecutors. You can imagine how those 26,000 Christians prayed for their persecutors before they were killed. Praying to the Father in secret, maybe in a garden like this one. He also says to not use empty words, vain words, just like rattling on where I'm not attentive, where I'm not turned toward him. He also challenges us to pray with purity of heart. That's conversion. Where I'm not looking for something. I'm not using him as some type of good luck charm. I'm actually looking to enter into relationship. That's purity of heart. And that also means conversion. Seeking first the kingdom of God. As that song we all knows, know based on the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added. That's prayer. So convert our hearts to the Father. That's the first thing that the Lord said explicitly. What's the second lesson we can take from his example? Pray in faith. We can pray in faith once we're attentive, once we've converted to him, because what is faith? Faith is filial adherence to God. In other words, I know that I'm his son. Beyond what we feel, we love him, okay? Sometimes we think that we love our pets more than we love the Lord, but it doesn't matter. We can affirm that. It's not feelings. It's actually choosing the Lord. And it's also adherence to God beyond our understanding. We know that our um, reason is limited, but he is infinite. And we also know that there's so many things that can cloud our reason. So it's saying, you know what? My filial adherence to you, my faith is based on my trust in you. He said, seek, because I am the way. He said, knock, because he is the door. So that is prayer in faith. What's a third explicit teaching of his? Well, to pray with filial boldness. It's related to faith. I pray in faith when, I'm, uh, when I realize I'm a son or a daughter of God. And this is where Mark teaches us in chapter 11. He says, whatever you ask in prayer, Believe that you will receive it and you will. Okay, that's the power of prayer. But most especially, you know what it is? 
It's the power of knowing that I have a father who will give me the best that I need. Mark also says, all things are possible to him who believes. Let's never doubt the power of prayer. Mark goes on to tell us that Jesus tells us that he's sad when people pray with a lack of faith. And Matthew continues and he says, those of little faith, he even says this about the apostles that were there, you know, in the storm on the Sea of Galilee. Of course, who would not be scared? And he says, wait a second, do you trust in me? Oh, you have little faith and you have great faith, he says to the Canaanite woman who comes to him. So what is the key here? Like I said, faith and the filial understanding. I trust my father, loving, merciful. He's like a shepherd that cares for his sheep. Remember the shepherd who has the, the view, the perspective of the entire um, field. And I'm the sheep just looking at my little pasture, what I can do and what I can eat. And he says, trust me, trust me. And if a sheep asks for something because he knows he's going to be well cared for, of course the shepherd's going to take care of him. Of course he'll take care of him. What's another lesson? Prayer of faith is being disposed to do the will of the Father. And of course, he taught us this himself. Mary taught us this. And Matthew says it's not just when we say, Lord, Lord, but rather what we have to do is to bring into prayer the desire to be with him, the desire to follow his will. And also what's interesting is the desire of cooperating with his plan. That actually makes us happy and fulfills us completely. Fifthly, the Lord teaches us to pray with watchfulness. Be attentive. Again, it's uh, you know coming to the Orthodox ceremonies or the Eastern Rite ceremonies, we have a deacon who comes out of you know, the doors of heaven and he'll have a, a stole on his arms and he will say, um, listen, be attentive, to be watchful, to be watchful. I'm converted to him, I'm watching him, who he is, who he was, and who he will be when he comes again. So Mark tells us in uh, his first chapter, the first chapter of his gospel, that the kingdom of God is at hand. Be attentive to the kingdom. There's signs of the kingdom all around us. And that's why, of course, one of the most important things that we can do to be attentive to the Lord and be watchful is to keep a lumina. What do I think he's been telling me? What are the lights? What are the words in the gospel, in the Bible that have struck me? What are the things that I can um, give thanks for to keep this, be attentive to his presence? Because we can miss the signs of the kingdom if we're not attentive. So this is the content. It's simple content, but it's very clear in his teaching and probably said right around here. But the other thing that the Lord did here in beautiful places like this and places in Galilee, we can imagine, he actually taught us about prayer also through parables. And so I just want to underline some of the most important ones. If you open the Bible to Luke chapter 11, he tells us a parable about perseverance in prayer. And this is what he says. As the friend who knocks on the door asking for bread, remember that parable? Please get up in the middle of the night, give me something. And the Lord says, be persevering because he says, though he will not rise to give him anything because he is a friend, because of his insistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. Another parable which is told by Luke in the Gospel of Luke chapter 18 is prayer is the constancy of asking. And this is when he tells the, the parable of the widow, remember, who's just saying, you know, give me a good judgment, etc. And he says at the end, the widow kept coming to him asking for vindication. Because she keeps coming to me, I will vindicate her. She keeps coming. She keeps coming. So will God not vindicate his elect who cry to him day and night? Perhaps this is a difficulty. We don't ask enough. We don't constantly ask him. What's another parable? Luke chapter 18. The Lord says, when you pray, be humble. It's when he tells us the story of the Pharisee and the tax collector you know, trumpeting what he's done, or the tax collector who's very quiet, hidden, beating his breast. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Lord says, this man went down to his house justified. Everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. My humility in prayer. These are the parables of the Lord. 
Now, as I mentioned, if you just cross this ridge, you will make it to the Mount, which is the place where Jesus ascended into heaven at the end of his life. And the reason I wanted to point that out is because he tells us at the end of his life that he's going to prepare a place for us in the kingdom of God. And he begins to reveal to us the mystery of this prayer. He speaks of this as he ascends and he says in John 14, just before he came, just before his death, he said, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I will prepare for you the rooms in the Father's house. But then he adds, and this is really important, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. It's very common practice for us to say, in the name of the Lord, I pray. Or every single time we make the sign of the cross in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We're saying in the name of Jesus every time we do that. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. That's the degree of confidence. So to pray in Jesus' names, it means abiding with him. It's the same discourse where he's saying, I will abide in you as you abide in me because the Father loves me and I love you. And so the Father will love you. So this is a beautiful lesson, a mystery, of course. And then of course, the second thing he says is to pray in the spirit. In the same moment in John chapter 14 at the Last Supper, his discourses before he dies, he also says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will send you a counselor, the spirit of truth. Wow. Mystery of prayer, novelty for the apostles, something very common for us. But how often do we invoke the Holy Spirit when we pray, before we pray, as we start something? This is the um, ancient practice of the church with that beautiful prayer, uh, Veni Creatus, Veni Creator Spiritus. Come, Holy Spirit, come, come, because he is the author of prayer. He is our advocate. He is, as he says here, the spirit of truth. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. These are new dimensions of prayer. The Holy Spirit, in the Lord's name, Christian prayer. What does he teach us really here? It's communion with the Father, communion with him in the Holy Spirit, in love and truth. And this will bring us joy. So as we finish our time here on the side of the Mount of Olives, we can say, okay, when I'm in prayer, do I have joy? Do I have peace? Am I abiding? Am I attentive? Am I watchful? Am I constant? So many things that we can ask ourselves. So the Lord is continuing to teach us every day. And know that from here, on the Mount of Olives, we are praying for each and every one of you as we make, we make our way through Lent and follow the example and the teachings of our Lord. May God bless you.